Joel 2, verses 12 and 13. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Tear your heart and not just your clothes. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Brothers and sisters, what do the following people have in common? Following list of people. Pharaoh. Balaam. Achan. King Saul. Judas. Hopefully you're familiar with those names. Uh, what do they have in common? Well, they have in common that they all made a confession of sin. Perhaps they have other things in common as well, but, but that's something they have in common, that they have all made a confession of of sin which we have recorded for us in Scripture. They all said, I have sinned. And in each case, that was a false confession of sin. How do we know? Well, we see it in their actions. For instance, Pharaoh. Pharaoh said, I have sinned. But then what did he do? He continued to oppress God's people. Or Achan said, I have sinned. But what did he do with the idols that he had stolen? He hid them. Didn't destroy them, but he hid them. They all made false confessions. Confession of sin. Repentance is an essential part of being a Christian. Isn't that right? An essential part of being a Christian. But you can either make a genuine confession or you can make a false confession. And if you make a false confession, if that's your confession ultimately then that's going to lead to judgment and to condemnation. If you make a genuine confession, it's going to lead to mercy and restoration. See the difference? They're opposite from each other. And, and what do we all want? Well, we want mercy and restoration, of course. So we want to know what genuine repentance is all about. So what is involved in genuine repentance? Well, two things. And you see that listed in the bulletin as well. Um, turning from sin and turning to God. Those will be the points that uh, give structure to the message this afternoon. And as we look at Joel 2, verses 12 and 13, Joel shows us what this looks like. Joel shows us genuine repentance. And so the gospel message that will come out of this, Lord willing, is that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he will receive all who turn to him. That's what that means. He will receive all who turn to him in genuine repentance and faith. That's what we're looking at this afternoon. And so as we turn to Joel, Joel, brothers and sisters, is writing to a sinful people, sinful people of Israel. We're not exactly sure when Joel's writing, but likely he's writing just as Joash became king. Remember Joash? He was a, a boy when he became king, seven years old. And Joash's father and grandmother were told about them. They were wicked. But Joash was good. Joash was good. He was guided by a godly priest, Jehoiada. And so Joel's purpose, as Joel writes this prophecy, is to urge God's people to turn back to God. Because he's saying also, within this context, with this godly king, Joash, in charge, there is an opportunity for you, for us. An opportunity for renewal under, a, once again, a godly leader. But if you don't repent, if we don't repent as a people, there will be judgment. And so Joel speaks of judgment. We have this word calamity in verse 13, or harm in the New King James. And Joel in chapters 1 and the first part of chapter 2 explains what this looks like. He says the calamity that could come is a locust infestation. Locust infestation. And, and drought, he says, that's the second thing. And enemy armies invading, that's the third thing. And so he lays these three forms of judgment out. And he says in verse 11, the verse immediately before our text, the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? So judgment is threatened. That's the, that's the bad news, judgment. Judgment is the result of sin, right? That the reason we need to turn to God in repentance is because we first have turned from God and turned to sin, and it's sin that leads to judgment. Judgment wasn't 
It's, it's not original in that sense. It comes from sin. We saw Genesis 3 quite recently. We looked at that passage together. And in Genesis 3, we saw the sin of the first man, Adam, with his wife Eve. And it was that sin that led to the punishment of death. Death being specifically judgment. The most severe form of judgment. And, and we, we heard God say to Adam, you came from dust and you're going to return back to dust. That was the punishment for his sin. And so Adam died. And it's been a, that's been the case for everybody since then. Death comes to everybody. And now we can look at that for physical death, but we can also take this a, a different angle on this and say that we all need to die. Because of sin, we all need to die. We either need to die in sin, or we need to die to sin. See, that's a different way of looking at it. We need to die in sin or to sin. Those who reject God, those who continue to live in sin, will die in eternal death of their body and their soul. But those who turn to God will die to sin. That's what the Catechism is speaking of here in question and answer 89. Uh, what is the dying away of the old self, it says. And, and when it talks about the dying away of the old self, you think, well, what is that old self? It's the old man. It's... Adam, you could say, the first Adam. It is the sinful nature that is within us. We need to die to that. We need to turn from our sin and we need to turn to God. And so the question for us is, well, how do we do this? If we need to do this, how do we do this? But first we want to ask, why should we do this? What motivates us to turn from our sin and turn to God? Is it a fear of incoming disaster? A fear of judgment? seems to be that Joel's saying that, right? We've just spent some time looking at that, and that's partly true. Turn to God, and, and he will not send calamity. He will not send ruin upon you. That's part of it. But, but overwhelming that, that fear, overwhelming that is something positive. That's negative, right? Overwhelming that is something positive. Joel says, turn to the Lord. Why? Verse 13, second half. For he is gracious. And compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in love. That's why we want to turn to God. Remember, I, I said at the beginning here, there's two kinds of confessions. A false confession, which leads to judgment and condemnation. And a genuine confession, which leads to mercy and restoration. Well, we all want mercy, don't we? We all want restoration. And we see this in God. That's what Joel's saying here. God is able to forgive. He is willing to forgive. He is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love. And this then should motivate us by the Spirit working in us. This should motivate us to turn from our sin and turn to God because of who He is. Another example of this would be Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3, the context there uh, as Jeremiah begins his letter is that God has been speaking to Israel through Jeremiah of their apostasy, of their spiritual adultery. God said things like, you have defiled the land with your prostitution and your wickedness. You have played the prostitute with many partners. You have scattered your favors to strangers under every green tree. Very vivid language, very terrible language. That's what Israel was doing. And what does God say next? Jeremiah 3. He says, return, unfaithful Israel. I will not look on you with anger, for I am unfailing in my love. I will not be angry forever, only acknowledge your guilt. And brothers and sisters, as we listen to that, hopefully you, you're hearing God's character come out, God's graciousness, his, his patience, his mercy, his love, his willingness to forgive. You see, it is the character of God and, and the call of God that should motivate us to turn from our sin and to then cast ourselves upon him, seeking that mercy. So what does it look like to turn from our sin? What does it actually look like? What does it mean to die to the old self? Well, God says, I just said it from Jeremiah, acknowledge your guilt. Make a confession of sin. We could say in more simple words or different words, say sorry. Is that enough? 
Well, no, not really, is it? We, we know that superficial apologies are everywhere. All, people can say words, but they don't necessarily genuinely mean them. Think of Pharaoh again, or Achan. I mentioned those two earlier. They, they showed that they had a regret at getting caught, but they weren't truly sorry for their sin. Understand the difference. A regret at getting caught, but, but not really sorry for the sin. Have you ever felt that difference? I remember a time when I was in high school, and uh, I was in science class. And uh, my teacher had put me near the back of the class, uh, seated next to one of my best friends, who happened to be his son. And we would talk all the time. And he would tell us to stop talking. And we'd say sorry, and we'd continue talking before too long. And I remember one time, he got really mad. Uh, he, he, he told us to stop talking, and I said sorry, quickly. And he said, don't be sorry, be quiet. He was a big man, and he was, he was red and angry, and it was, very, it was a very vivid picture to me. Because you understand what's going on there, right? He's saying, words don't matter anymore. I need to see action. If you're truly sorry, you'll change. And you even see that, actually, in the Greek word for repentance. The literal, uh, full definition of the Greek word for repentance it is a turning of the mind and the will. We could also say a turning of the heart. And we see that in our confession as well. That's what we say here in answer 89. To be genuinely sorry for sin means to more and more hate our sin and to run from it, to turn from it. And so the genuineness of your repentance, ultimately, brothers and sisters, will be shown in whether or not you change your actions or I change my actions. Genuine repentance. So what is involved in genuine repentance? Well, first of all, true repentance must come from the heart. It's not a mere external or outward show. Joel says here in verse 13, tear your heart and not just your clothes. You see, people would tear their clothes all the time, their garments, their robes, whatever they had on them. That was an ancient custom that people would do. And the, the sense was that your clothes represent your personality, and as you're Ripping your clothes, that's representative of deep hurt, deep sorrow and pain in your life. A symbol of true repentance. People also would put ashes on their heads often at the same time too, and that was symbolic of, of death, right? From dust to dust, also from ashes to ashes is the idea. And so, so that was a ritual that showed grief. And God, through Joel, is saying, you know, that's fine. You can do that. But I want your heart. Return to me with all your heart, he says. With fasting and weeping and mourning. In other words, it's not just about those, that external show, that symbol, that ceremony. But give me your heart. Grieve on the inside for your sin. True repentance comes from the heart. True repentance also acknowledges that it's sin against God, ultimately. That's what, that's what you've done. Uh, repentance is not, true repentance is not grieving because you've been found out. But it's grieving because you've wronged God. And we see this in no clearer place than Psalm 51, which we sang earlier. A psalm of David. You know probably that that psalm was written uh, in the aftermath of his sin against Bathsheba and Uriah and, and the adultery and the murder that, that uh, David had committed. And you think, well, who did he sin against? Bathsheba, certainly. Uriah, certainly. Other people as well, undoubtedly, as, as all of that was happening. He was strategizing and plotting in this evil way. But what does he say in Psalm 51? We read in verse 4 there. Against you, you only have I sinned. He sinned against God, first and foremost. You know, this is why David is called the man after God's own heart. Because David was perfect. Far from it. But it's because of things like this, especially this, where, where David shows true, heartfelt repentance. He, he turns to the Lord with all his heart. He's a man after God's own heart. He pleases God with his repentance. Because, you know, verse 16 and 17 of that psalm, he says this. He says, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offering. 
My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. David gets it. He knows what true repentance is all about. Brothers and sisters, when is the last time you were broken over a sin? A specific sin. When is the last time you fasted? You were, you were so troubled by your sin that you, you didn't eat. When's the last time you wept because of your sin? Maybe on your knees, tears streaming down your face because of sin? Now, we don't need to live in that 24-7, but, but that kind of genuine repentance is very godly and good. When's the last time you mourned or grieved for your sin? True repentance is more than just the external. It's more than just words. True repentance involves action. It's a turning away. That's what we're seeing, a running from sin. Running from sin, but true repentance doesn't run from God. Because this is how David starts Psalm 51. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. You see, he's going to God with his sin. And then he says, cleanse me, wash me, restore to me the joy of your salvation. See, true repentance is evident. If, if we're looking, for instance, at a person's life, we would say true repentance is evident when a person draws closer to Christ. James speaks to us of this as well. James chapter 4, a sinner is urged to come near to God, and James writes there, grieve, mourn, and wail. You see similarities to Joel. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord. And that's true repentance. But you see, when you do that, all those things, when you do that, then God's grace, his compassion, and his love become very clear, abundantly clear. And so James doesn't just say that. But he says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You see, there's that other side of it. And this is the good news, that God is eager to forgive. God delights in forgiving his people. He doesn't do it begrudgingly. He delights in it. And again, if we look at our passage here, our text, we see that. We see the heart of God here. He says, return to me. I'm gracious and compassionate. I'm only angry because I have to be, but I'm overflowing with love. You see, that's his nature to love. God, we could say it this way, has a disposition to forgive. A disposition. The actual transaction of forgiveness can't happen until we repent. But he has a disposition to forgive. And then once you do that, he will not despise you. You see, if you come to him, with that broken heart. He will not turn his face from you because he turned his face away from his son that's, so that he would never have to turn his face away from you, from me. That's the gospel. He will draw near to you in mercy and love. And you know that because of Christ. And he will give you a spirit as well. Even as David prays in Psalm 51, Lord, renew me by your spirit. If that's your prayer, he will do that. And so true repentance also involves renewal. That gets at what question and answer 90 are referring to. It's not only a dying away of the old self, but it's a rising to life of the new within us. You see, Scripture says things like, the one who belongs to Christ Jesus has crucified the sinful nature along with its passions and desires. We hear that, we, we read that, we want to say, but then what? Because you see, if you're crucifying desires, that means there's a void that's created. A void of desires, and that void needs to be filled. Jesus uh, illustrates this for us. He's speaking with his disciples, and he says, there's an unclean spirit, and it leaves a person. And we could say that that's like a house being swept clean. So we have a clean house. But if it's an empty house, if no one else lives in it, then what's going to happen is that spirit's going to move back in, and he's going to take some friends with him. You see? See what we're saying? See what Jesus' point there is? The Spirit needs to move into your heart. He needs to dwell in it. 
And then he will lead you to new passions and desires. The old ones are crucified, but there's going to be new ones that replace it. And so we could say that our delight in sin needs to be replaced with a delight in God, that joy needs to take the place of temptation. Answer 90, a wholehearted joy in God through Christ and a love and delight to live according to the will of God by doing every kind of good work. And you see, that is the secret to overcoming our desire to sin, ultimately. People, people look for that. You know, what is the secret to overcoming sin? Well, ultimately, if you're desiring sin, to desire him more is the answer. It's not always as simple as to say that, but, but ultimately that's what's happening. A lot of paths we take to get there, but, but it's, it's knowing that we have been raised with him to walk in newness of life, right? We, Romans 6 says that we've been baptized into him by his death. We are with him in his death, but then we're also with him and he's raised. We've been raised too to walk in newness of life. And so that's the work of the Spirit in us. You remember even last time, Lord's Day 32, Christ has redeemed us by his blood and he is renewing us by his Spirit into his image. He's transforming us to be more and more like his son. Gives us these new desires. So brothers and sisters, this is a gracious work, this work. It's not our work, but it's the spirit who does it in us. He, he works in us this new and living way. The new way that Christ has opened up for us. You see, we haven't opened it up for ourselves, but Christ has done this for us. And Christ then is the one who enables us to turn to God in confidence and in hope. You see, because we talk of repentance and confession, that, that's a hard thing. We need to turn to him, but we can do that with confidence instead of fear because of Christ. And yet that confidence can never be in ourselves because we are so in need of his grace. We are so in need of his spirit. And so we need to constantly turn to him. Is repentance something that only happens once? Some people might want to say so. We're a church of Christians. You don't need to tell us, pastor, to come to Christ because we've already come to Christ. We don't need to hear the law read on Sunday. We don't need to sing songs of confession whether in our personal prayers or our corporate prayers. We don't, we don't need to pray, forgive us our sins. Those ideas exist, right? Perhaps, perhaps some of you have even felt this. Now we want to say true, we have been forgiven in Christ. That is a, a past accomplishment. We have been forgiven in Christ. We have died to sin in Him. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He or she is of the new creation. That's very definitive. And yet, yet we need to continue to die to sin in the old self. The catechism has it right. We need to continue to do this and then seek the rising to, uh, of the new within us, the rising to life of the new self. Repentance and forgiveness, brothers and sisters, are ongoing. Sinclair Ferguson, you've probably heard of him, says... Repentance does not merely begin the Christian life. According to Scripture, the Christian life is repentance from beginning to end. So long as the believer is at the same time righteous and a sinner, it can be no other way. That's well put. That's, that's right. Brothers and sisters, it is right for us to pray, forgive us our sins. But as you do that, as I do that, as we do that together, let's do so with confidence knowing that God delights to forgive us our sin. Again, he doesn't do it grudgingly. He delights in it. And in Christ, in Jesus Christ, God is able to maintain his justice while also justifying us. Romans 3. We have a generous God. We have a, a God who is merciful, a God who is loving to all who look to him in repentance and faith. And so approach his throne in prayer in humility, but do so boldly. Remember, it's the throne of grace. On the basis of Christ's work for you, we saw this last time, pray that Christ would work in you. 
that he by his spirit would put to death the old self and bring to life the new. That you would then have, as answer 90 says, a wholehearted joy in God through Christ and a love and delight to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Father in heaven, we have sung previously this service from Psalm 51, that beautiful psalm of confession, and we, that we are unworthy, that we have sinned against your grace, that we need your mercy because we are sinners. And Lord, we come to you this afternoon with acknowledgement of this and also acknowledging, Lord, that we don't often grieve our sins enough that we treat our sin too casually often. That sometimes we are content, or at least more content than we should be with that piece of our sinful nature which still clings to us. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be genuinely sorry for, for our sin. That you would help us to more and more hate it and to run from it. And Lord, we pray that in the place of our sin and our temptation, that you would you would put new desires, that you would put that joy, that wholehearted joy that we can have in you through Jesus Christ, your Son, to love you and to live for you, to delight in every good thing that you have called